Hey everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast, where we cover the full spread of food and beverage industry topics. My name is Bianca, PR and marketing professional by day and food and wine connoisseur by night. And my name is Nick, an accountant with a passion for barbecue, beer, and whiskey. Today, we welcome Michael Nagy. Michael is the bar manager at the Lavish Lounge Bar in Auburn, New York, the owner of Razor Spirits Cocktail Events and Consulting, as well as the author of The Cocktail Revolution, Journey of a Liquid Chef, which was just recently released. In today's episode, Michael enlightens us on the expansive knowledge that a liquid chef brings to the table, some great cocktail ideas and recipes for you to try at home, and how he serves as an alcohol concierge to the patrons that mosey on up to his bar. With that said, let's get into the podcast. everybody. Today we're welcoming Michael to the podcast from the Cocktail Revolution. We're going to learn all about his new book and have him introduce himself and a little bit about his very unique background in the industry. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. Um, yes, I'm very excited about the Cocktail Revolution journey of a liquid chef. Uh, what brought me to doing this book, obviously COVID has hit us all very much. And I wanted to make sure that um, I occupied my time with something productive. Uh, it's a passion of mine to do writing, uh, to, do, to engage in bar talk, and to educate the world and be an informed and educated drinker, as I always tell people. A um, little bit about my background. It's kind of a diverse, uh, different type of background. I didn't get into the bar and restaurant industry until very late in life. I was 29 years old. I was a stay-at-home dad. I was very, very bored with my life, and I require a lot of socialization to be happy. So as a result of that, um, I needed to seek out a career uh, that could both be engaging, utilize my people skills, and my um, ability to work in customer service, which I had done quite a bit in college. Um, I answered an ad in the classified uh, section of the newspaper, which was basically advertising for a bartending school. I decided to sign up for that. Two, three weeks later, I got my certification and started from the ground, from ground zero in the field. And from there, it just kind of grew into a love and a passion and something that uh, I wanted to stay with. So uh, the biggest adjustment that I needed to make is being a stay-at-home dad uh, and working in corporate America for most of my life is now I'm going to be working evenings. Now I'm going to be working uh, weekends and I'm going to be doing different shifts and sometimes working until 2 a.m. and then getting up with the kid at 6 a.m. That was going to be a struggle for me, but I knew it was something that I really enjoyed and I could stick with it and, and had a lot of potential in it. So I'm originally from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I currently live in Geneva, New York, uh, which is central New York. Uh, it's right in the heart of the Finger Lakes, uh, which is wine country. I came up here in 2019 to pursue my wine uh, passion uh, in the industry to work with some fine wineries and vineyards in the area. I was a wine educator for three different vineyards uh, off of Seneca, Cuca, and Cayuga Lake. Uh, and in that time was also the tasting room manager. So I really enjoyed that. But I got a call out of the blue from someone who found my resume on Indeed. And they were looking at opening up a brand new bar and restaurant about 30 miles east in Auburn, PA, or in Auburn, New York. It seemed intriguing because part of my history and where I'm at today is a result of working with a lot of different bars and restaurants and helping them out, helping them grow their brand, helping them with cocktail menus, helping them with visibility and marketing and promotions and all that good stuff. And I thought this was an opportunity that maybe I could kind of infiltrate back into the bar industry uh, and still do the wine stuff. So I did both for a while. Then um, as business grew and more responsibilities grew and things were going well, I decided to kind of put the wine stuff aside a little bit and concentrate with the bar and restaurant, which is obviously something I've been doing over the last 18 years since uh, 2002. And that brought me to getting back in the industry, brought me to that passion that I once had for this industry. And I decided to take off on another book journey. Um, I had published a book back in 2007. It was kind of like a coffee table book, something that people could reference if they were home bartending. Hey, I need to know what the exact ingredients of a margarita are. Uh, let's look it up. We have Michael Nagy's book here. This one turned into more of a narrative, more of a commentary, uh, more of an advice column, um, things not to say, things to say. Um, how to make certain syrups and purees and mixers and just a general knowledge about the bar and restaurant industry. And as you may have noticed, because uh, I know you got a copy of the book, uh, a lot of anecdotal information and funny, 
quotes and things that people have said and experiences and situations I've been in and my colleagues have been in. So it was fun writing, like I said, because I'm talking about the bar and I'm writing about the bar and I'm kind of laughing at myself at things I've said and done over the years. And uh, so I'm very, very proud of the work. So yeah, it was a long haul to get where I'm at. Um, I'm a 49 year old bartender slash mixologist slash liquid chef, which is unheard of in the industry. Um, but I have a lot of youthfulness and a lot of zeal and passion and determination. And, and that's what you need to bring to the table. For this industry. And I got to read a bit of this book so far. I haven't gotten to go through the whole thing, but one of the sections, for example, that jumped out to me was how not to embarrass yourself. Yeah. So that, I thought that was a pretty interesting part that I got to read. And yeah. one thing I noticed is that the way it's written, it really is like a narrative and it feels like you're talking to the reader and mm -hmm. really just telling a story and it's very easy to read. It's yeah. not dry at all. It's not anything that's going to bore you. It's just exciting. And it's just a nice, easy read that you can pick up. And it was very enjoyable from what I've gotten to experience so far. Great. Um, so before we really dig into the book, do you want to tell us, I noticed a couple other things poking out on your Instagram. So you have Lavish Lounge that you were just talking about there. Mm -hmm. And then you also put on, it looks like uh, Raise Your Spirits uh, cocktail events. So yes. what are those? Well, I started back in 2012. I started my own business um, after I was doing the bar and restaurant thing. I decided I was kind of old enough and knowledgeable to kind of work for myself and not work for somebody else. So I started as a blog, um, doing blog posts on different drink recipes, wine, um, again, like stories and, and things that I was experiencing in the industry. And I decided, well, you know, the late nights and having somebody tell me when to work and how to work and those kinds of things were getting kind of old. So I started Raise Your Spirits as a blog initially to get the word out. Started with a business card, grew it to being the primary provider for uh, local weddings, company events, uh, mixology parties, wine tasting parties, and things like that. So from there, I created uh, kind of my own mobile bar service. So raise your spirits essentially is, um, you know, play on words, raise your spirits as in the spirit. And then of course, raise your spirits, have a good time. So I did that for about seven years. Um, it became a little oversaturated because what people were doing is they were going through catering companies and large uh, firms to provide their services. And I was a small little, you know, mom and pop shop that was not, not, had to charge what I had to charge. Um, and the bigger companies had a little bit more kind of pool in the community. So I kind of did more, I focused on more private parties for individuals like yourselves who wanted to have like a, a cocktail event at your house. or you want to have a little celebration for a birthday party or retirement. And I would do a cocktail menu for you. I bring all the equipment, I bring the bar. Um, so you essentially take the bar to the people that, you know, are hiring you to do that kind of work. Part of that as well was consulting with local businesses, bars and restaurants. I call myself kind of a poor man's John Taffer um, from Bar Rescue. Uh, I don't have his deep pockets. I don't have his uh, financial backing, but what I was doing with Raise Your Spirits as well as prior unofficially as a freelancer was um, going in and helping with those things. You know, helping train the bartenders, getting them certified in responsible alcohol management, um, you know, teaching them the tricks of the trade, uh, increasing speed, improving accuracy, um, making sure that uh, they're doing it the right way. I'm kind of a classic cocktailian, I like to refer myself. I mean, I like the classic cocktails, but I like to bring forth those classic cocktails and, and do different twists and modern, um, well, modern variations on those. So I was able to do that with my own business called Raise Your Spirits. When I moved here to New York, um, of course, the liquor laws are very different in New York from Pennsylvania. Um, I kind of had to make some adjustments. The premiums for my liquor liability was a little bit higher here, um, and I was doing well in the wine and bar industry. So I decided to kind of put it on hold for a little bit. But um, with COVID, I wouldn't be able to do much of this work anyways, because events are not happening. Um, large gatherings are not happening. So um, it's something I definitely want to continue to pursue, um, do it kind of as a, as a side thing with what I'm doing at the bar and restaurant right now. Yep, and I have one question that's been burning on me. Whenever you talk to someone about alcohol, everyone seems to have their one go-to. For me, it's whiskey primarily and specifically yeah. rye whiskey. That's what I'm sipping on okay. tonight. Uh, that's my favorite. What Good. was the spirit that really got you, your first spirit that really got you hooked into alcohol and uh, that you have the biggest passion for? I can relate to you very much because it was actually bourbon. So it was another kind of whiskey, uh, an American-based whiskey. Um, I had worked as head bartender at Marriott International 
um, which had serviced the larger uh, metropolitan area in Harrisburg, PA, the capital of PA. And we had serviced a lot of international travelers and people from all over the world and the country. And as a result, they had very high needs in terms of specific type of bourbon. So with my position there, I was able to go to the general manager and talk with the hotel chain to try to get some really, really nice bourbons in there. So I, we were able to do bourbon flights, which is kind of unheard of back in you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so they were able to get single uh, barrels. They were able to get uh, small batch bourbons from Kentucky and Indiana and Iowa um, and all the ones that uh, most people didn't really hear about, very obscure, you know, bourbons. So I became very familiar with bourbons. And as a result, I started to use those in cocktails because, you know, a lot of people don't think of bourbon as being a primary cocktail ingredient. You know, you think, oh, bourbon on the rocks, bourbon with a splash of water, maybe bourbon and Coke, but it can make a pretty damn good cocktail. And uh, besides a Manhattan and an old fashioned and those types of classic drinks, you can do fruity drinks with bourbon. Uh, you can do muddled drinks with bourbon like the mint and julep. Uh, so there's a lot of variation you can use the bourbon. Now it's, a, it's my sipping drink. I mean, that's what I sip on at the end of a night, do a little splash of water and have a nice, even a maker's mark, which is a call bourbon. I like that very much so. Um, very much into the Four Roses. Um, Jefferson's is one of my favorites. Hard to get sometimes here in New York. And New York is really good about um, having distilleries that are making local bourbons now, which I'm really excited about because I'm, I'm planning on getting my hands on some of those. So as a result of sipping them and trying them and finding which, which ones I really liked, um, I was able to grow my bourbon knowledge and um, you know use those in cocktails for, for parties. In fact, I did a Cowboy Western party a number of years ago where everybody dressed up dressed up like the uh, old type saloons in the old west and i created a cowboy cocktail menu which was using rye bourbons um you know a few uh, uh you know other types of whiskeys as well so so yeah it was fun jumping off of that so people have their go-to's a lot of the time people are kind of set in their ways when it comes to cocktails when it comes to the cocktail comfort zone, how do you encourage people to step outside of that as a bartender when people come in and ask, they want to try something new, but they're pretty set in their ways? Right. Um, what I try to tell them to do is there's a lot out there that they aren't aware of. So it's part of my job is to educate and inform, which is what my book is doing as well as what we're doing here. Um, part of them, like whiskey was a big thing for ladies a couple years ago. I remember having many people come in and say they like to get into whiskey, but they just can't stand the, the burn, you know, and it was too heavy and too dark and too strong. So they have this stereotype about what it is, but maybe they've had a bad one. Maybe it wasn't mixed well. Um, maybe you need to give them a sample of something to try, you know, just like you would with a beer or a wine. Um, so get them interested in that. And then also kind of what it, like a sommelier does with the, the table. For wine you know what do they like to eat what do they like to drink do they like sweet do they like fruity do they like strong do they like citrus you know all those kinds of things and help kind of formulate a profile for the person and this all can happen within a minute uh, and and kind of you know say hey, let me put something together for you if you don't like it I can completely understand and if you know what you're doing um, most times they're going to be happy with it now somebody will say well I definitely like vodka you know, make it, make it with vodka. Well, it's tasteless, odorless, and colorless. So you can pretty much mix anything with it and it's pretty standard, but um, there's a lot of different vodkas out there. You can do uh, muddling, you can infuse it. I do a, a beautiful cucumber infused vodka at the bar right now for summer and I mix it with lemonade. So sick of the same old vodka, uh, you know, bars don't have cucumber vodka available, but we're actually making cucumber vodka for people to try in our lemonade drink for the summer. So it's just, again, back to, the, back to the education piece and making sure people know what's out there and what there is. And if somebody sees a bottle or they ask a question, you spend time with them, just like a sommelier would do at the table, um, you know, or if somebody's using your business as a consultation for what you're doing uh, for them. So um, that's kind of how I approach it. Uh, I make sure they see a cocktail menu. I highlight things that they may like that are good uh, for most people. And then what do they like? And uh, they tell me what they like and we either go off the cocktail menu or we stick with something there. And then if they plan on having a steak or they plan on having seafood or whatever it may be, believe it or not, in the cocktail world, you can pair cocktails with food. It does work. You know, so I will pair a nice cucumber lemonade cocktail with, um, you know, our coconut shrimp or, um, you know, a pan seared uh, snapper or something like that. So 
Yeah, the world the world is is wide open for you as far as cocktails, just like it would be for wine if you went to a wine bar. Same concept. And another question for you, another fun one. Is there any specific alcohol that you can absolutely not drink because there's one night that you went too hard on it and whenever you yeah. smell it, it makes you sick? There's actually a reference in the book and you're going to laugh about this because you're a whiskey fan, but it's scotch. And the reason it's scotch whiskey is because I had a horrible stomach virus on New Year's Eve attending a family's wedding at the hotel that I used to work at. And the, stop, the scotch, the cigar, and the stomach virus didn't mix very well. Um, so as a result, I was viciously sick. And now when I see or smell scotch, I don't necessarily get sick again, but it does turn me off to the point where, no, you can't talk me into having a glass of scotch. I don't care if it's Macallan 25 or it's uh, Johnny Walker Black Label or Green Label. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay away from that. So outside of whiskey, the only other one that kind of made me a little ill, um, probably because it go back, goes back to my college days when I wasn't an experienced drinker and I drank way too much, uh, was Sambuca. And it was the black Sambuca at the time, which you know, the white is a little bit more tame than the black. But I was drinking it like it was you know, water and syrup and all that licorice. I like black licorice, so I was drinking a lot of it. Um, drank way too much. People think, oh, it's it's a cordial, it's a liqueur, it's not that high in proof, you know, it's, it's licorice, it's, it feels good, it gives you good breath uh, when you're trying to pick up a girl, but in reality, if you drink too much of that, you get pretty messed up too, so, so those two things in particular. <laughs> There's definitely been nights with too much scotch and cigars in an empty stomach without enough sugar that'll definitely make you think twice for me, but I do love a good scotch still. Mine yeah. is Fireball, I can't do Fireball. Again, young college really? day type of deal, yeah. too much. But again, that's not a big loss. There's my palate's definitely grown to a point where that's not something that I would ever crave at this point. Right. So. Right. <laughs> well, if you ever want to, you ever want a variation on Fireball? Um, we do. A, we do a Fireball and a rum chata mix because rum chata is a, is a cinnamon based rum cream. So you can actually feel like you're eating a cinnamon toast crunch cereal. That sounds good. An interesting one. That definitely if you like that cereal, try to drink sometime. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like a good fall drink. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the book, back to the book, uh, what can your readers expect to find from this book primarily? I know we kind of covered it, but what are like mm -hmm. your key takeaways that you want people to know? Well, I want people to know that uh, when you, and it, this kind of uh, alludes back to what we were talking about, when you walk into a bar or restaurant, um, you are profiled. No, never mind. I'm not going to say that. No, um, I want people to take it lightly for what I say. Um, a lot of the jokes and the sarcasms and the cynical nature of the book are supposed to be entertaining, um, not necessarily based in science. So I want people to read it from cover to cover like you would any book, but treat it as something that is real and raw. And it's something that we experience on a daily basis. And I've done it for the last 18 years. And these are things that bartenders are thinking all the time or they're muttering under their breath or they're telling the server in the kitchen. Um, but I also want people to understand too that it's a fun environment. It's a place to escape. It's a place to go. Um, you always have a reason to go to a bar and have a drink, whether it's you're celebrating something special in your life or you need some counsel, uh, you need to socialize, you need to be with other people. Um, we have a couple old regulars that are at our bar and they very rarely ever socialize with anybody, but feeling that they're in the social environment kind of makes them feel good. You know, they're retired and widowed and they like their whiskey and water and uh, they're there every day religiously at the same time and leave at the same time. So I think the biggest thing about the book is, is education, um, also training new and up and coming bartenders. They're often, um, you know, they're lacking in skill. Um, so I'm hoping people pick up the book to learn a little bit of something for that that are in the industry or people that like to entertain at home and you know, and they don't really want to trust online or they want to have a quick, easy book to be able to grab and read and say, oh, this is, this sounds like a fun drink. Let's try something like this for the party or event that we're going to be having. Um, and then lastly, I want people to feel the passion and enthusiasm from the pages um, that I really enjoy what I do. Um, I love what I do and uh, that um, it is a fun industry for people that have worked in the industry. It's very hard work. Um, it's a performance-based job. You know, you work well, you do well, um, you get paid well, and you move uh, on to bigger and better things if that's your plan. But um, yeah, so I wanted to make it for the people. I wanted to make sure people enjoyed it, were entertained by the book, but also learned a lot from it. 
Um, and if it made them more of an informed and educated drinker, that's kind of my goal as well, to be able to help you guys out. And when you go to a bar, things that uh, you may not want to say <laughs> or things that you may want to say to kind of help the bartender figure out what uh, what you want to drink or what you may want to try or um, just kind of the, the etiquette that's involved with it. And you kind of answered a question that I was going to ask, which is really what was your target audience going to be for this book? But it seems like people can use it as sort of training wheels when just getting into the game or if someone that's been in it a long time, but have been really stuck in their ways can use it to kind of really explore and yeah. learn new things that they didn't know before. So definitely wide open and it's definitely worth a read from everybody that wants to give it a shot. Yeah, appreciate that. I have so, another, oh, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask um, what some of the most popular drinks people request in the bar are. Mm -hmm. Sure. Like, are there ones that are asked for all the time? Yeah, I will tell you uh, most religiously each year, they actually come out with a top 10 list that are the most ordered drinks in the world, actually. It's not as much nationwide as it is the world. And the ones that always appear on there would be your traditional rum and Coke. Uh, Bacardi is actually the biggest distillery in the world, and they actually have the most exported liquor um, in the world. So a lot of people get their hands on rum and Bacardi rum in particular. So that's always up there, the margarita outside of Cinco de Mayo and uh, you know Mexican holidays, it's very, very popular all year round. Some of it's more seasonal, like right now more margaritas are moving than they would in the winter time, for example. Um, Cosmopolitan, the sex in the city, the, you know, the red drink that uh, you know, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker always drank and talked about, that's still very popular, although it didn't become popular until that show. Uh, nobody really knew what it was prior to that. That's still very popular. Standard martini, I would say more people than not are drinking more vodka martinis than gin because they can't palate gin or they don't understand gin or it has to be mixed a certain way for it to be easier to palate and some people don't do that right. Uh, Long Island iced tea, that infamous tall drink that people want to drink when they want to get drunk and they want to feel good. Um, it does take, taste like iced tea if you use the right amount of Coke and you don't put too much alcohol in it. Uh, and outside of that, um, basic highballs, vodka tonics, vodka sodas, more people are getting a little bit more affluence on premium vodkas. So you may have, you know, the Grey Goose and tonics or the Kettle One and tonics or the Absolute as opposed to a Well vodka or a um, Smirnoff or a Stoli or something like that. And then more and more each year, you're starting to hear about more muddled drinks because bartenders traditionally didn't like to do a lot of muddling because it takes a lot of time and customers didn't want to wait for them. But you're finding more and more made with mint, uh, more and more made with fresh herbs and spices. I use a lot of basil. I use rosemary. I use saffron. I use thyme uh, for a lot of our summer drinks as well as our fall and winter drinks too. Um, so you're getting more modern, kind of modern classics, I like to call them, because mint's been used for a very, very long time, but most people just associate mint with a mojito and a mint julep, but you can use it in a lot of other cocktails as well. So that pretty much doesn't change year to year. Um, you may find regionally that is different. Uh, you may find like in the Northeast, I find more and more people drinking what's um, popular and what's made here. In my particular situation, uh, we have more bourbon and whiskey drinkers than we do have scotch, even though it's a high-end establishment, whereas you go down the road to the country club, you're going to have more scotch drink. So it kind of depends on the environment in which you work, um, what the bartenders are saying, um, how are they selling, and then um, other things about the bar, you know, what they carry and what they don't carry. So those are kind of the basic cocktails that you'll find inside and out. And uh, back to our earlier conversation, sometimes you do have people like saying, well, I'm kind of sick of the same old drink. This is what I normally drink. Can you do a variation on it? Last night, to give you an example, somebody who drinks margaritas from California visited the bar. They wanted something a little different than their standard margarita, and they wanted it spicy because they like spices. So I said, okay, let's do a spicy margarita with jalapenos. Muddle jalapenos with agave nectar, simple syrup, shake it up make it a standard margar a margarita, but have jalapenos and spice and everything in there. And they loved it. So that's how you can take somebody who likes a drink and turning it into something else. that's still that drink, but looks different and tastes different. Very cool. And one thing I wanted to pick your brain on since you are the expert is home entertaining and home bars. We recently yeah. sold our dining room table and put in a little home bar. 
uh-huh. um, in our apartment. So we've been thinking a lot on stocking it. We mm-hmm. had a ton, obviously, since we've been doing this podcast, our, you know, we've been expanding our horizons a lot and talking yeah. to a lot more people, different wineries, distilleries, a lot of local ones, uh, local distilleries here, like Three is Strong and Liquid Riot that make really good stuff. Mm-hmm. So we've been getting some of that. But one thing that we're lacking is a lot of mix-ins and syrups and mm-hmm. different ingredients to make the cocktails and all the classic sure. cocktails. So when stocking a home bar, where would you suggest to turn to for the simple start for your basic home entertainer to have something that they could make a little bit of a lot of different cocktails without mm-hmm. going too deep and have, spending too much money on getting right, everything? Right. right. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to, if budget isn't an issue and you really want to get some really good fresh stuff, you know, I always recommend homemade. Now, of course, that requires a juicer, that requires some time, whether you're squeezing oranges or squeezing grapefruits um, or, you know, just buying something from the store. But I'd obviously recommend where you can use fresh ingredients, obviously do that. Um, If you are on a budget, and obviously it's a lot easier if you're doing a party with friends or just people that really don't care about that stuff, um, you obviously want to stock the main juices. uh, And the main juices, I will tell you, are going to be orange juice, cranberry juice, and pineapple juice. They're gonna be your basics. Grapefruit is not as popular anymore, even though people traditionally drank vodka grapefruit or drank uh, sea breeze, which is vodka, grapefruit, and cranberry. Um, not people, people don't do that anymore. You always wanna carry lime juice as, uh, lime juice is more of a, um, I call it a modifier, meaning you don't put a lot of lime juice in a drink. You usually do a splash, a half an ounce. That would be for your gimlet martini, that would be for your margarita, that would be for your mojito. Um, also some fresh lemon juice. I, I do my own homemade uh, lemon sour, which I think you would really love. If you can take away this from this little section is I make it all fresh. So instead of buying that store-bought stuff that's been sitting on there for two months, the shelves, or getting it from a gun in a bar, or just buying lemon juice and getting sugar and mixing it all up, make a nice simple syrup on stove top, do equal parts of that with freshly squeezed lemon juice, and then you have a fresh sour mix that you can use with any liquor out there. You can have a whiskey sour, vodka sour, rum sour, gin sour, scotch sour, bourbon sour, whatever you want. And uh, that can go with a lot of drinks. Um, It can go in a standard highball, or you can put it in a margarita, for example. Um, You can put it in a Tom Collins. Um, a lot of drinks uh, from that lemon sour that you can make. So that that's always cool. And then I always recommend if you have a high-end crowd where you're serving a lot of martinis or Manhattans or old fashions and things like that, um, have a bottle of bitters, Angostura bitters or orange bitters if you prefer. You can usually get those in the, in the grocery stores here in New York. Um, and then also, in addition to the bitters, um, you want to have the sodas. Uh, I would probably say uh, most of the time uh, people – We'll drink regular cola, um, but you know more and more people are more health health conscious, so they'll drink uh, you know diet cola with their their drink. But it's funny, I got to tell you a funny story. People just like uh, that order all the diet sodas in their drinks end up usually drinking or eating something that has the most calories from the restaurant. So they're drinking a, a vodka and diet coke, but yet they're, they're having a pasta that's two thousand calories. So it's like it defeats the purpose of going to McDonald's and or, ordering a diet coke and ordering two Big Macs. Not sure why they're doing that, but hey, to each of their own. But um, yeah, so the basics, uh, Diet Coke, uh, Diet Pepsi, Coke, Pepsi, ginger ale, uh, tonic water, club soda. Those are things you really can't make yourself. But if you want to get adventurous, um, you can make actually homemade um, juices. You just have to squeeze them, use a little sugar um, and water and make them, you know, make them in your kitchen if you wanted to do that. I always recommend if you're doing a splash of lime, have a lime available and just slice it and squeeze it over a drink. And that's all you really need for a drink, those kinds of things. If you do have gin, um, you'll find that most people don't use gin anymore. Again, it's kind of an acquired taste. So um, what we used to do with our business is we would get gin for a party and it would be left unopened by the end of the night. For 250 people, you would think, hey, somebody's going to want a gin and tonic, right? Somebody's going to want a Tom Collins or a gin martini. No, it's just not trendy anymore. It's not popular. So I always tell people, if you want gin for somebody you know um, that likes those kinds of things, great. Um, Or that special bottle of scotch. But I wouldn't have it as a part of your inventory if you're doing a party. It's just not, not worth the money. 
Jin's always at my kind of party, yeah. so I don't know who these but, people are. <laughs> and you know what, gin that I would recommend too. Have you had some of the floral gins that are coming out now? A lot of them are made a little bit differently than the big boys, like the Tangerays. Like a couple that I'd recommend to you, Bianca, would be a Bloom Gin, B-L-O-O-M. Um, also a gin out of Washington State. It's an American gin. It's called Aviation. That's really, really yep. good. So, I have that one on our bar card. That is a very good, good one. <laughs> Great with citrus, so yeah. that goes well in any of those citrus drinks. And I can say, in my experience, I have honestly never tried a gin, and I need to. I have yeah, nothing against them. Stuff. I just, <laughs> I go, like I said, I have tequilas, I have vodka, I have bourbon. I have so much that I tend to gravitate towards that when I'm mixing around in the rotation, it's just something that never comes up. So right, right. I got to get myself something to try them out. Yeah. And now you have a book, Nick, to learn about what you should there make you with it. I know. And, and I there's know plenty of gin recipes in there. Yeah. So go that go from that perspective. Yep. No doubt. In our apartment, our uh the classic cocktail that we tend to gravitate towards, especially my girlfriend loves them, uh the Moscow mules. Mm -hmm. So we always have ginger beer and lime stocked here with the nice. vodka. So we're yeah. ready to go with that. So we already got that covered, but that tends to be the extent of my cocktail making. Mm -hmm. right now everything yeah. else is kind of straight and i'm a big beer drinker so obviously nice. you're not mixing beer with much so right right in your experience what is the hardest liquor to work with i would probably say the hardest liquor to work with would actually be traditionally this is the way but i found a way around this uh would be tequila people don't think of tequila being kind of like a basic mixed drink like they think of the tequila sunrise, right? Orange juice, a little bit of grenadine looks pretty. That's what you mix tequila in. Oh, you put tequila in a margarita, um, frozen straight up on the rocks. But believe it or not, tequila is so versatile and you can hide some of the spiciness from the tequila by just making sure you pair it with something that works. Um, I do, let me give you a drink that I think you guys will absolutely love and I'm featuring it this week. It's called, it's a creamsicle. It was National Creamsicle Day, like the old-fashioned creamsicle we used to eat. Um, back in the day, I, it was made with amaretto, but I did a whole new version of it that has tequila as its base. It has fresh orange juice, fresh cream, or half and half, whatever you want to use, fresh agave nectar, a little bit of orange liqueur, triple sec, shaken up, served uh, as a martini, and it tastes exactly like an orange creamsicle. And that's an example of how you can have a tequila-based drink because you like tequila, but nobody knows about that drink, you know, unless you sell it and you talk to people about it. It's actually in my book as well. So you'll be able to grab that. It's definitely one we're going to have to try and everyone should definitely try that one. Who can go wrong with the creamsicle, right? Now, when it comes to tequila, what camp are you in when it comes to style? Blanco, Anejo, Reposado, what do you tend to gravitate towards when drinking straight and when making cocktails? Yeah, when I make cocktails, unless people want to pay for it, um, it's always going to be a Blanco, um, especially if you want to preserve the quality of the, of the coloring. Um, plus, you don't have as much of a deep or rich, richness or a heaviness uh, from the Blanco, so it's a little bit more mixable in a cocktail. Um, if somebody wants uh, like a gold margarita, for example, um, you would use, I use a lot of um, 1800 and, and um, Cuervo for that if they wanted that, which is, a, you know, an upsell, of course. Um, I very rarely use Anejo or Reposado unless it's straight up um, or if it's, uh, you know, on ice, something like that. I'm kind of a, a big tequila fan as well, and I like organic tequilas, and there's quite a few that exist out there if you can find them. Those are really good straight up. Um, but I would probably say that uh, the most of the tequila drinkers that I know um, will either have it as a shot or have it in a margarita. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, if you want to experiment, like one thing that pairs really well this time of year with tequila, and you guys, your listeners can, can get this information from the book as well as right now. Tequila goes really well with strawberry, watermelon, which are really good times of year to do that, to get some fresh watermelon, fresh strawberries, you can muddle it in tequila. It goes well with jalapenos, which I did last night. Um, I've even done it with cream-based drinks. So think of a white Russian. Vodka, Kahlua, and cream, right? Try vodka or try tequila, Kahlua, and cream. Just try it out sometime. Both are Mexican. Shake it up over cream and drink it. It will give you a whole new experience and a take on the white Russian, and it will be good. I will say I have done that with bourbon, Kahlua, and cream. 
have you? Mix it up with another one. Yeah, that's another one that we have there in the cabinet. Uh, nice. In my cabinet right now, I'm kind of a spice junkie. I love spicy foods and spicy drinks and everything. So right now I have my Espelon Anejo in there. Oh, as a, excellent. As a whiskey drinker, that's kind of the tequila that I gravitate towards. It has a very similar sort of flavor profile while changing it up and going with the tequila. Right. And then the other one that I just added to the cabinet, we're actually going to be interviewing them this week, is Ghost Tequila. Are you okay. familiar with them at all? I've heard of them. I'm not real familiar, but I'm obviously going to tune in to find out yep. more. So they're, uh, they're a ghost pepper infused tequila. Wow. And uh, recently I was at a friend's house and he had it and I tried it for the first time and I knew when I tried it, I'm like, oh, I have to talk to these guys wow. and where their head was at there. I think uh, from the story that I understand, they wanted to be able to make a spicy margarita kind of mm -hmm. a shortcut way. So they sort of infused the tequila with the ghost pepper. But again, tune in and you'll hear all about it pretty wow. soon. So that is, that is pretty cool. Yep. And, yeah, and if you see in my book, I have, based, so. that's great. Uh, I have it. I have some tequila infusions in the book as well. Um, so I think it's a Serrano chili uh, tequila. You can actually do it home. And I go through the steps of doing that. If you ever want to do that. Definitely. So. I'll have to try it. Yep. Have you um, experimented at all being sort of into whiskeys and bourbons with infinity bottles or anything like that? Have you heard of those? I have, I have heard of those, but I really haven't done much experimentation with them. How about you? No, not yet, but it's something I'm reading a book right now called Hacking Whiskey. I don't know yeah. if you're there, yeah, um, and they've been talking a lot about it, and it's something that I am thinking about trying getting started, so I'm looking that for someone, cool. a little experience, but I got to decide, I guess, which way I'm going to take it, um, which if I'm going to stick with rye or bourbons or scotches or just do right. a blend and go crazy, who knows, but. You guys have a lot of rye available uh, where you live? Are there much of a selection of rye whiskeys? Because you said you like that. So the one place that I'm in Maine now, we don't have quite as big of a selection up here as we did at home, but there, I'm sure you're familiar with the chain called Total Wine mm -hmm, yep. um, in New York. I think they had those. We had a couple of those open up recently back home in Boston where we're from, and they have obviously just a huge selection because they're such a big chain. So I had kind of the pick of what if there was something that I wanted to try, they pretty much always had it right? Um, right. going there. But lately, since moving up to Maine, the craft beer and craft liquor scene up here is so big and so profound with mm -hmm. the local market that I've been just trying basically all the local flavors. And I know um, Liquid Riot, I think they do a rye, they do a bourbon that we tried the other night and that was delicious. It was a really um, mellow and oh, great sipping whiskey. It wasn't a high proof, so it wasn't too strong. So it'd be a great like entry whiskey or entry bourbon if you're going into it. Uh, but I kind of just try to stick to what we have around here. Right. Cool. Nick, what was that other one that we tried from Liquid Riot? I forget the name. Yeah, so this so this was an interesting one. Neither of us had, a, had a tried it. It was a Fernet. Oh, yeah. So Liquid Riot, uh, Ian Michaud, Michaud, I try to pronounce his name correctly. Um, mm -hmm. He makes it himself. It's a... Uh, lot less as he described it medicinal than some other fernets and right. one that you can drink more straight yeah and when i drank it it was awesome it was just so good. huge huge hit of mint as soon as you drank it right and then a lot of herbal like green tea almost flavors on the back mm -hmm. end it was really tasty and i Sounds think it would be good mix and stuff you'll be a candidate for gin if you like that herbal stuff because there's like 13 botanicals that are in gin and they're all made nat they're all from the ground or different flowers and leaves and things like that so you may dig that so yeah, i'll recommend i'll send you i'll send you a list of recommended gins for you to try first definitely and before we kind of close out of here getting back to the book a little bit i know you mentioned the, the difference between a bartender and a mixologist and a liquid chef you want to go into that a little bit and tell us sort of the difference in what people should expect to see when sure. going out? Yeah, I like to equate the evolution of the bartender kind of like how you would in the wine industry, you know, where you have, you know, kind of a master of wine or you have a master sommelier, but you have like apprentices throughout the process. I think you kind of earn the title that you get as a result of years of experience and kind of going beyond the normal um normal position as it as it would entail. Um, I like to think of bartending um, is a service job. It is a service job. I mean, all those jobs are service jobs, but bartender at its most basic level is a service job. Uh, the knowledge don't ne doesn't necessarily have to be vast. 
Um, you have good customer service skills. You can serve a rum and coke. You can pour a beer. You can pour wine. You can maybe make recommendations. The next step in the learning process is the mixologist. And the mixologist is when you're able to take different bottles of things and mix them together to create something that um, is creative, innovative, colorful, tastes good to satisfy your patrons, um, to create you know, a drink from scratch. We all kind of have signature drinks that we create for our customers. Uh, and the liquid chef, I like to look as kind of the, the top of the mountain kind of thing where a liquid chef has a lot of uh, similarities with a regular chef, a sous chef, uh, somebody who you know, works in a kitchen where you're doing gastronomy, uh, you're doing food pairings. Um, the mixologist may not know what goes well with you know, this particular fish or this particular entree or appetizer, but the liquid chef will. A, knowledge and experience. B, trying things. Unfortunately, you have to kind of be uh, a little intoxicated to kind of learn some of these skills because you got to try things and you got to you know try them uh, sometimes too much at once um, goes a long way but um, trial and error and then what you get what you graduate to with this liquid chef I think is just kind of um, you can make anything that anybody asks for you can change ingredients you can change brands you can substitute a similar flavor and you know the balance of the cocktail will come out perfect Mixologists can do that as well, but I think what's separate, it's a lot smaller of a window from mixologist to liquid chef than from bartender to mixologist. That's a huge window to get to that point. But a lot of bartenders are not in the business as a career. Uh, they don't intend to do it beyond college, making a little money, have a little fun. You know, they're 30 years old, they're having a kid, they get going to corporate America and they have to make money and, and work normal hours and do all that. But if you have a passion for this industry and you want to graduate from the bartending role to be more of a mixologist and more of a liquid chef, it's you have all the tools. You have access to those things. Read, study, practice, try things with each other like you would with a bottle of wine. Try it with the food, see if it pairs well. Do the same thing. Um, try different types of tequilas, different kinds of juices, um, different kinds of uh, ingredients to be able to kind of achieve something. And um, yeah, know your fruits, know your herbs, know your vegetables, um, you know, know all those things and what goes, what pairs well from a gastronomy point of view. And on that, I rarely, I try to really learn more about everything, especially in the kinds that are like, like a whiskey. I rarely buy the same bottle twice. Right. I just want to try so many. And then I have the, yeah. the staples that I go back to when it comes to bourbon, like Woodford, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. it's one that I can always go back to. And I know I'm going to, get a high quality bourbon that's you know not a crazy price that's a good one but right. it's uh definitely fun a lot of fun to explore all the different nuances the different brands and liquors and even the different runs you know every barrel doesn't taste the same when you get it right. to certain runs so it's a uh, definitely a lot of fun to dig into and i think there's a lot of people can learn from this book so to get into that where can people find your book people can find it on amazon.com uh, you can search uh, Michael Nagy, which is my name, or The Cocktail Revolution. It's available by Kindle, uh, hardback as well as paperback. Uh, they can also work directly with me if they would like to do that um, by emailing me at mnagy, all lowercase, 52371 at gmail.com, and I'll answer all the inquiries that people send. Um, I have social media links for people to be able to reach out, uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, my name is Michael Troy Nagy. Um, my business is Raise Your Spirits. I do answer from both of those pages. Uh, and then on um, Instagram, you can reach me at Michael underscore Troy underscore Nagy. And then also uh, Raise underscore you are underscore Spirits uh, to find me there. Awesome. Well, we had a great time talking with you. I know this book's going to end up being a staple on my bar that I just built great. over there. So we had such a good time and learned a lot. And I look forward to trying some of these cocktails that you have right. in the book. Yeah, yes. I'm looking forward to hearing back from you guys about that too. <laughs> and for all of our listeners, we will put the links, all the links in the show notes so they can access them directly. Um, yeah. So it's easier. <laughs> great. Cheers. Cheers. Right, cheers, guys. Have a great one. Be sure to follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening. Thanks.